Welcome to Functional Philosophy, the show in which I, Charles II, explain and apply Ayn Rand's philosophy, Objectivism. If you'd like to ask me a question on Objectivism or its application, just go to charles2.com slash contact. And my last name is spelled T as in tango, E as in echo, and W as in whiskey. Do you think the obsession with sports teams in America and globally is an expression of collectivism inculcated within the culture? If so, to what extent do you think this is responsible for said obsession? Well, I question your premise here. Is there really an obsession with sports teams in America? In some countries, there definitely is. There are such things as soccer hooligans, and I think in some places in South America, they decapitate referees who make calls they don't like. I don't mean to imply that happens regularly, but I also don't think it was something that came out of nowhere from some crazy guy. Americans don't appear to be that obsessed with sports. If Americans do give their preferred sports teams, an undeservedly high place in their hierarchy of values, there is still clearly a significant difference between that and what happens in some other countries who are truly and obviously obsessed. In any case, wherever obsession exists, is it the result of collectivism? No, I don't think so. I see why you would draw that connection superficially, but I think it's specious. At least in the American context. In the context of other countries, the ones I mentioned where they regularly get violent in a way that doesn't happen at least as frequently or to the same degree in the U.S., then that may be a different story. But I don't have the first-hand knowledge of those other countries, so I'm just talking about you know, Americans who will scream at the TV when their sports team is losing and who have clearly placed an inappropriate emphasis on sports teams in their lives. For those people, no, I don't think it's collectivism. I mean, are, are these people really acting like what matters is the team beyond me? I'm just a cog in the machine. I have to act for the glory of the whole. That's not really it. Again, I see why you would draw that connection, because it's, oh, it's a team, it's the group over the individual, but as I say, that's specious. If you look at how crazy sports fans in America act, it's not in that kind of collectivist way. It's much more similar to someone who makes anime or video games the core of his identity, and does no productive work there. Just the consumption of these things becomes his identity. And that's really the essence here. In America, I don't think the people who go overboard with sports are doing it out of a sense of collectivism, but out of an attempt to attain some personal identity outside of their productive career. That's really the mistake here. It's the same as being obsessed with any hobby or any form of consumption rather than production. You don't make your identity out of consumption, because that is derivative. You produce first, and you can only consume after you've produced. That's not to say consumption is unimportant. It is a major part of life, but it is not the primary part of life, and it is not essentially what you do. The core of your identity should be the form in which you use your mind to create values. It should be your career. You hear this all the time. People talk about how, oh, your career shouldn't define you. That is what causes people to become obsessed with sports teams and all the other things they become obsessed with, because they have no identity, no productive identity, because they've been told that's wrong. What you do for a living shouldn't define you. It should be the things you love, which people take to mean the things you love to consume. It should be your hobby or some secondary issue. Oh, I like to travel. I like to go to the beach. You know, these kinds of things people always talk about when they say, oh, more than just my job. That is where obsession with sports comes in, at least in America. 
Have you ever noticed how you can't actually enjoy consumption if you take production out of your life? I remember during the summers when I wasn't in school and I could just sit there and play video games for as long as I wanted. And I would start to realize that I wasn't enjoying them. My enjoyment would slowly disappear because the video games only mattered because they are rest from and refueling for work or school or whatever. But there's no such thing as rest if all you do is rest, and that's a relative concept. You can't rest from not having done anything. The same thing with art. If you just went to the movies all day, or you just read novels, any kind of art, if that's all you did and you didn't have any personal values, then art would lose all meaning to you. It's supposed to be emotional fuel. That's why it's enjoyable. But emotional fuel is to fuel you in action in your life. If you're not actually acting in your own drama, in your own life, if you're not pursuing your own values, then you can't relate to art. You can't enjoy consumption. You can't enjoy reading novels or playing video games or watching sports as a primary. And certainly not alone without any kind of uh, productive work. You've probably noticed that when you're in a relationship, love stories tend to be more impactful. I've heard the same set of stories involving the relationship of parents and children. When you're a father, those kinds of stories mean much more to you. They're much more impactful because they relate to your life. So sports is exactly the same way. You couldn't even enjoy sports if strategy and athleticism, some form of physical fitness at least, achieving victory within a set of rules and obstacles, if that had no relationship to your life, if you weren't doing that in your own way, then you wouldn't relate to sports at all. It would have no meaning to you. You wouldn't be able to enjoy it. Who cares? So I think in America, people who are unduly interested in sports are because they lack a productive identity. And sports just happens to be their way of filling it up. But it's no different from an anime nerd who's doing nothing with his life. I'm not saying nobody has a collectivist element there. I'm sure many of these people often feel, yes, I'm part of the group, I'm part of the tribe, but I don't think that's primary. And I do think, for the most part, interest in sports teams, because that's what your question is about, teams, in America is rational. Why do people enjoy sports? Because it's a test of athleticism and skill and strategy and you're seeing the best, and there are objective rules. Yes, all of that. But then why care about any particular team? Why not just watch and wait to see whoever's the best and praise them? Well, it's out of a sense of selfishness. It's out of recognition that only individuals exist, that you are you. You know, when you go to your job, you want to make money. You're not doing it to improve the economy. You're doing it to make more money for you. You have to have a selfish interest in things for them to be interesting. If you're just watching sports in this detached way and you don't care who wins and you're not rooting for anyone, it's really boring. One way to give yourself a selfish interest in who wins is to bet on sports games, which I think is totally legitimate and fun. But another way is to choose, semi-arbitrarily, a team to support and stick with it. Having a team to root for, having a selfish interest in a particular team's victory, is what makes sports fun, essentially. Viewing sports, I mean. So if you're not on the team, or you're not the coach, you have to find some way to care about who wins. And one way of doing that is just to pick a team as I say, more or less randomly. And this is why most people just go with the team of their birthplace. And that's fine. That's as rational as any other way. That's probably the best way. 
in real life, there is no God's eye view. You're not just concerned with, you know, people in general doing well. You want to do well as you, as a particular individual. So it's boring to just sit there and watch the season play out and wait to see who wins. You want to be connected with some particular team, and I want them in particular to win. The same way I want to be successful for myself in life. I don't want people in general to be successful as an end in itself. I want to be successful for me. So you say obsession, and obviously obsession with a sports team is wrong. But the fact that you seem to think that what exists in America is obsession suggests to me that you think that concern for any particular sports team at all is a form of collectivism. And it isn't. It is really a form of recognizing that only concretes exist. I mean, again, let's compare this to art. I mean, is, is drama interesting if you're not rooting for or against someone? No, it'd be boring. It is boring when you see that. You know, I tend to actually like the bad guys in a lot of popular fiction. If you take uh, Song of Ice and Fire, for instance, early on, I really liked the or an evil character who was a bad guy, but he's the only one who had a purpose. He's the only one who had a value, who was pursuing something, whom I could root for. Whereas all the good guys are just, eh, I'm just sitting here. I want the status quo. I don't want bad things to happen. I need, you have to pursue something. I have to root for you against opposition. And unfortunately, obviously morality is associated with not valuing, and of course, it's only evil people who selfishly pursue value. So I find myself relating to villains often because they are the ones who value passionately, even if what they value is world domination or something like that. <laughs> but anyway, the point is, concern with a particular sports team, uh, the desire for your particular sports team to win is totally rational. And I think sports would be essentially useless without. There might be some value still left in, in sports playing, certainly, but in terms of viewing, maybe a little bit, but I mean, 99% of the value of sports comes from rooting for a particular team. Have you ever sat down and tried to watch two teams you didn't care about play sports? It's boring. So if you get to the point where you start screaming at the TV in rage, then... That is probably a sign that the victory of this team means far too much to you because you have your identity wrapped up in this team rather than what it should be wrapped up in, which is your productive career. But if you just prefer that a certain team win and you feel a reasonable degree of happiness or sadness when they win or lose, that's totally fine. And that's exactly how sports should be. Sports are totally rational. Not women's sports. Anyway, not professional women's sports. Women's sports are a joke and nobody should watch them. And practically no one does, so <laughs> I don't need to convince anybody of that. Next, I'm constantly seeing people express the idea that it is wrong to judge someone based on their beliefs. Instead, that a man may only be judged for his actions. For example, it would be wrong to say that a Muslim is evil just because he believes in Islam and that people should self-sacrifice for Allah. Rather, it would only be appropriate to judge a Muslim as being evil if he actually acted out his beliefs by murdering infidels. My response to this would be to point out that beliefs lead to action and that people who poison their minds with falsehoods will inevitably be influenced by them in action. Well, I'll pause right here. Yes, I agree with that. That is why what people believe is important. That is why consciousness is important, because it leads to action in the physical world. So that is why ideas are important. I do have to point out, though, that beliefs are not moral or immoral. I mean, it's not belief in Islam that is immoral. It is the act of evasion that leads to that belief. So if it were possible to come to the idea that you should be a Muslim terrorist rationally, if mistakenly, 
then that wouldn't be immoral. Morality is an action, not a static belief or anything like that. Anyway, questioner goes on. I also like to appeal to absurdity by saying something such as the following. Hannibal Lecter is evil because he wants to murder and eat people, and he likely will if given the opportunity. But if we strap him to a table such that he is unable to move and therefore act out his evil beliefs, is he no longer evil? Interjecting again. Well, there are two things wrong with this. First, again, morality is about action. I mean, mental action. Yes, morality does relate to what you do in your mind, even before you act in the world. But again, just as morality is not about your beliefs per se, it is also false to say, as you said, quote, Hannibal Lecter is evil because he wants to murder and eat people, unquote. No, it is not the desire to murder and eat people that is immoral. It is the action that got him to that place, the mental action, the act of evasion that got him there. Assuming that is what got him there, and there's not just something wrong with him that's out of his control. Ideas are not evil, in the same way that emotions aren't evil. Not per se. Now, you could say that there are some ideas or emotions that you could only have as a result of being evil. And that's true. But still, the act that is evil, that constitutes evil or immorality is the act of evasion. It is not the derivative consequence. It is not the emotion, per se, the desire, the belief, the idea. It is the act that led there, the irrationality that led there. Now, the other thing that's, no offense, stupid about this is <laughs> that Hannibal is being restricted by force, whereas a Muslim who is free to act out his ideology is choosing not to because he's not being restricted. So if he's not doing it, there's some mental process going on that means he is voluntarily not acting it out, which is not true of Hannibal if he's strapped to a table. Questioner goes on, in addition to this, I've heard Jordan Peterson say that a man's beliefs are defined by the way he acts. So if someone doesn't act according to his stated beliefs, then he doesn't actually hold those beliefs. Well, that is dumb. Integrity would have no meaning if that were the case. What is the virtue of integrity? It is acting in accordance with what you believe. But if what you believe were defined by what you did, then there would be no question of acting in accordance with what you believe, because you would always do that. Let's concretize this. Just think about when people break their diets. You're on a diet. You know you'll be healthier and happier if you don't eat this piece of cake. And then you eat this piece of cake. Okay, now what does that mean? What happened there? Does that reveal that you actually didn't believe that you would be happier if you stuck to your diet? Obviously not. You knew you would be happier if you didn't break your diet. That's, in fact, why you feel instant regret once you break your diet, and you feel bad about it. That's not revealing what you actually believed. If you break your diet, that doesn't reveal that you actually never believed your diet would make you uh, happier, and that you really believe that eating this piece of cake will uh, be best for you. No, obviously not. What you did was shove out of your awareness, what you do know, so that you could just eat that piece of cake without thinking about it. No, how you act does not determine what you believe. This is a Socratic mistake. This is what Socrates believed. That knowledge is virtue. People only ever act wrongly because of ignorance. That is false. Again, you can demonstrate this for yourself just by introspecting about any kind of similar case, any kind of case that's similar to breaking your diet. Well, what's going on there? Is it really that you didn't believe that you should have done what you should have done? Or is it that you ignored what you knew momentarily so that you could do what you shouldn't have done? 
Questioner goes on, should people be judged for their beliefs, and if so, why? How do people's beliefs, not actions, relate to my happiness? What does belief even mean? Well, you can't throw that in at the end there. That's another question entirely, so I'm not going to go into that. Here, it's too substantial. But should people be judged for their beliefs? Well, this is really the essence of your question. How do ideas relate to actions, or really... How do mental actions relate to physical actions? As I say, beliefs, ideas per se, just like emotions, that is not the question here. The question is, your internal mental activity, is that immoral even before it manifests in physical action? And the answer is yes, it is, for the reason you indicated. Mental action leads to physical action. Even if nobody knows, and before it actually results in any physical consequences, evasion is immoral. However, that doesn't mean you can judge a man for his, well, you say beliefs, but again, not beliefs, but for his internal mental processes. Because you only know about those mental processes through their physical manifestation. You have no direct access to what's going on in someone's mind. So even though it is immoral, before you have any knowledge of it, again, that would be primacy of consciousness. Evasion is immoral, even if no one but the evader is aware he's evading. However, you can't judge someone as immoral before you know he's been evasive, and you can't know he's been evasive before you have evidence for that, and the only evidence you can get is through his actions, under which I include speech. So no, immorality does not require physical action, but being able to judge someone as immoral does require physical action, because you have no other way of knowing whether somebody has been immoral. You know, it's like gremlins on Mars. Suppose there really are a bunch of gremlins on Mars. Well, they exist, even if we don't know about them, and have no reason to even consider them. But we can't even consider them until we have some reason to. But that doesn't mean they don't exist. So yeah, somebody's immoral, even if nobody recognizes it. But you can't recognize it until you have some evidence. And the only evidence you're going to get is through this person's actions. Now, even then, it can be tricky. Because the consequence of evasion can be indistinguishable from an honest mistake. You don't know if somebody's belief in the minimum wage comes from honest mistake, or is that evasion? Could be either. Now, if it was a result of evasion, that's immoral, even if you can't tell which one it was. But you can't judge him as immoral until you start talking to him and you realize that he is not honestly trying to understand the issue and he's darting around and arguing in circles, then you can say, okay, this person is being evasive, but only because that evasion has manifested itself in his actions. So evasion is a mental act, but in order for you to know that that mental act has taken place, you have to look at the physical consequences, because that's the only evidence you will ever have access to. And now aside from people's judgment, is something that takes place only in your mind immoral? Yes, and for exactly the reason you said. Because mental action leads to physical action. If you'd like to keep up with everything I do, just go to charles2.com. If you'd like to enable me to do more, just go to patreon.com slash charles2 and become a supporter. Thanks for listening.